This is a picture of a Red Cross worker helping a baby after the devastating earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Now, I could show you thousands of pictures like this from all around the world of people helping people, and not just particular people, like their family or their friends, but people they've never met before, and people who may never be able to provide them with the same help back. These people put themselves at risk by going to areas beset by natural disaster, disease or civil unrest, for example. All around you every day, individuals are helping one another. You might have done it yourself today, but why did you do it? That's the deeper question that I want to address today. For example, why, when you went to the shop and someone dropped their money, did you tell them? Or, when you were on the bus, why did you give up your seat to a heavily pregnant lady like me? Now, these two gentlemen here, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, together came up with the idea of evolution by natural selection. What they suggested is each individual should pass as many of their own genes onto the next generation as possible. Because by doing so, their genes are more likely to persist into the future. And so then it becomes a puzzle. Why help someone else to reproduce and put yourself at risk? What is the cost of helping others? Why is cooperation all around us? Unfortunately, it's really hard to ask this question of humans. For one, humans are long-lived, so I can't look at the effect of cooperation over an individual's whole life. And for another, humans come from different cultural, educational and socio-economic backgrounds, so it's hard to make controlled comparisons. So I ask these questions of animals instead. So this is a masked weaver. Masked weavers are found in southern Africa. This male is busily building his nest, and it takes him many hours, even many days, and he receives no help the whole time that he is doing it. And the final structure is quite a small enclosed chamber. Contrast that with this colossal structure here. This is the nest of a sociable weaver, also found in southern Africa. Now, I think the leopard gives a good idea of the scale of this nest. Now, the weaver is a small bird. It's only about this big, like the size of a sparrow. It probably took hundreds or even thousands of them to build this nest. The resulting structure, as well as being a nice place for a leopard to sleep, is very robust. It can last for years or even decades. Sometimes it lasts until the tree falls down. And inside that nest are individual chambers, which are very thermally stable. And so by working together, these sociable weavers may have achieved more than if they were working alone. And this idea that by working together we achieve more is something that I wanted to get direct, quantitative measures of. And so I set up my own population of this wonderful little bird here. This is the Pied Babbler that lives in the Kalahari Desert. They are completely wild, and they're free to move about their natural habitat. And the first thing that my colleagues and I did was to habituate these birds. We teach them not to fear us. We teach them they don't need to be afraid. They can go about their daily lives and totally ignore us. And by habituating them, we're able to look at their everyday lives and get detailed observations that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Now, pied babblers are what you could consider a typical cooperative breeder. Each group defends a territory year-round, and there's one dominant male and female, and the rest of the adults in the group 
help to raise the young of the dominant pair instead of trying to breed themselves. And helping can come in many forms. Individuals take turns to go on sentinel to look out for predators and warn the group of any approaching predators. They help to defend the territory borders. They incubate and brood the young. They feed the young. And they even teach young, when they're older, where to find places to forage. Help is so prevalent in this species that individuals can spend more than 50% of their day helping to raise babies that are not their own. So this is a huge sacrifice to make. In order to understand the cost of that sacrifice, I compared helpers among groups of different sizes. And I wanted to ask questions like, when you're helping, are you more likely to live longer? Are you more likely to have access to a better quality mate? Are you more likely to breed when you get older? And one of the ways we measured health in these birds is to train them to jump on and off a scale for us every day. So we give them a small food reward, and they give us their weight. We found some fascinating results. Individuals that live in groups live longer, are healthier, and produce healthier and more babies. So it starts to become clear why these babblers are cooperating. They're getting huge benefits from doing so. What further convinced me of these benefits of cooperation is what happens when an individual is kicked out of its group. And this does happen. So you see here on the x-axis is the number of days since an individual was kicked out and was alone in the population. We call that an individual that's floating with no fixed territory. And on the y-axis, you have its weight relative to how heavy it was when it was in a group. And you can see that these individuals, when they're kicked out, lose weight steadily. Weight is crucial for the ability to reproduce, to fight for access to a mate, and to fight for access to a territory. And so the longer these individuals are out of a group, the more and more uncertain their future becomes. So why do we see such a big trend? It's because many hands makes light work. So when individuals are living in a group, they share the duties of looking out for predators. They share the duties of raising the young. Each individual has more time to look after themselves. However, living in a group has its challenges as well. The more individuals you interact with, the more, the more individuals you need to remember. For example, who is reliable and who's a cheater. That information informs future interactions with those individuals. You want to interact more with the reliable one rather than the cheater. Now, if you think of your Facebook or similar social media account, you can think of the number of friends on there as the size of your social network. And some individuals have the ability to recall information about hundreds or even thousands of people in their network. And social animals have to do this as well. And that may have led to the evolution of bigger brains. Now, I don't necessarily mean physically bigger brains, but brains that are more able to assimilate and use social information effectively. The idea that by living in a group makes us more intelligent is really evocative. But again, it's difficult to ask these questions of people, so we ask them of animals instead. Here is an example a research student of mine did with the Arabian babbler. The bird has to learn the association between a color and a food reward. In this case, white gives you food, black does not. And so he should ignore the black and use the white. And you can see that he has learned this task pretty well. He's made a little mistake there, but in general, he's learned this task pretty well. It seems to be that animals in larger groups do solve tasks quicker. And not only that, but they are able to pass these skills onto other group members. And so I want to give you another example from here in Perth. My research group 
works on the Western Australian magpie. We set, or rather my research student did, set the magpies a task. And the magpies solved this task very quickly, sometimes even on the first try. And that's what we expected, because the magpies are highly social. And so I set the same task for university students. <laughs> and the magpies solved the task quicker than the students. <laughs> so what do we conclude from this? Do we conclude that magpies are more intelligent than students? No, we don't, because a task that's relevant for one species isn't necessarily relevant for another. We can't make the direct comparison. But what we do know is that magpies are able to solve novel tasks, and living in a group may have allowed them to solve these tasks more easily. Cooperation not only allows us to live longer, be healthier, and produce more young, but it might make us smarter as well. Of course, cooperation has its limits. Once group size gets too large, resources start to become exhausted, and cooperation breaks down into conflict. Now, conflict should be as familiar to us as cooperation. It is all around us every day, just like cooperation is. But the more we understand about cooperation, the more we understand about conflict. And this is not interesting just from an evolutionary point of view, but I think it can hold important lessons for human society as well. Cooperation benefits all, not just those being helped. And my research has shown that living in a group allows individuals to get more benefits than living alone. Some would argue that the true sense of community has been lost in the hustle and bustle of modern-day life. But I would like to suggest to you that if you take time out of your day to stop and help someone else, it may be one of the most rewarding and worthwhile things you will do in your lifetime. Thank you.